welcome all Fight Club followers. Uh, I'm Ed Farron and I'll be your UK Fight Club host for this evening. Uh, Co-hosting with me is uh, Arnel David and uh, Gareth Davies, who uh, you'll hear lots of uh, in just a minute, is our guest speaker. Uh, just a reminder on some admin points before we get going. Uh, all have been uh, emailed to you in advance and they are showing on the screen there. Can I just uh, reinforce uh, the muting until the discussion, question and answer ses session? And to pose your questions, please use the Slido link and please note the change in the hashtag. It's no longer Hotel 188, it is now uh, Romeo 676. And uh, when the question and answer session is over, please do not all disperse um, back to your physical lives um, because there are some Fight Club notices uh, at the end where we will tell you what we have uh, coming up. Uh, I will just say, first of all, I'm very impressed by Gareth's ability to market himself uh, thus far. Uh, quite some uh, well-known individuals uh, on the call. Uh, uh, I'll give a personal shout out to uh, Colonel McCutcheon, who was the old college commander when I went through Sandhurst on CC093. So, sir, thanks very much for, uh, for coming. I hope you find this of use. Gareth, uh, next slide, please. So hopefully this is the webinar you've dialed in for in, uh, in lieu of the, the Mars landing. Uh, if I see a, sp a, a, a trough in attendance at uh, 5 past 9, I'll know where you've all gone. Um, I just want to say that Gareth is the, is the first speaker we've got who's actually um, internal to Fight Club. All the other speakers in the 2020 webinar series were, uh, were not members of Fight Club. So Gareth has kindly volunteered for the guard room to deliver this webinar. Uh, today. So without further ado, Gareth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you to all of you at the Fight Club. Um, I am a member of Fight Club. I'm a pretty passive member at the moment um, for a number of reasons. One, um, half the games don't work. I'm a, a Mac user. I worship at the altar of Job, so half the games don't work on a Mac. Uh, but I bought myself a gaming machine uh, just for Christmas. Uh, but it's Windows and I'm a complete and utter uh, buffoon when it comes to Windows and I haven't been able to get anything working. But hopefully we will. Um, sorry, gone the wrong way. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the, um, I think, the role of history in the preparation for tomorrow's fight. I think that's what Fight Club is all about, preparation for tomorrow's fight, um, whether it be from a developmental, developing ideas, whether it's practising ideas, um, trying out new things, I, I don't mind, um, but it is that preparation uh, for tomorrow's fight. Now, I've looked through the list of names. Um, I didn't know who was going to turn up to this. There's a, a couple of members of my fan club, a, a couple of um, harsh critics of mine. Um, so uh, I need to be absolutely on point. There's a couple of people I have no idea who you are, so I don't actually know what your interest is and what your level of knowledge is. And so I just want to start by, by uh, apologising that if I at any stage are starting to patronise you, I do apologise significantly because that is not the intention. Um, I've got a lot of stuff which I think is of use to a lot of people, um, um, but some of it will be um, perhaps well known to some of you. So there's a slight danger that this is just the daft ideas of, of Chairman Gareth, um, but I'm hoping it's a little bit more than that. I'm hoping it's an idea of how you can use, we can use, um, military history alongside gaming uh, to help us prepare for the fight tomorrow. Um, I'm starting with a quote from uh, Margaret Macmillan. Um, I'm not trying to be clever by putting this up, but hopefully some of her brain will, will uh, wash, wash off on me. Um, I'm using her word because she's the clever one. Uh, when I was starting to, to talk about what I might talk about, I suggested uses and abuses of history and then realised, no, uh, that's Margaret Millen's title of her book. And I think this quotation, which um, I think Jonathan Fennell originally highlighted to me, but I've used it in a couple of documents, um, fully referenced, of course. Um, I think this, this, this is a useful uh, line. Um, a few words leap out to me, and I think they made, uh, uh, I th and, and the ones that leap out to me initially are unique, um, useful lessons, warnings, if used with care, alternatives, and form the questions we need to ask. And I think that also applies to what Fight Club is doing. 
Um, so that to me is what the important elements of Margaret Macmillan's quotation and, and military history are. What is military history? I've got a short video, it's a couple of minutes. Um, it does have sound, but I failed to, failed to put the, the driver on, so I'm going to talk over it. But um, what is military history? And this is a promotional video um, put together by the House of Cavalry Regiment last year. Um, but already we're seeing a bit of history and we're also seeing uh, the now, which has been informed by history. Um, so CBRT, and I'll talk about CBRT in a bit. Um, there's some interesting history surrounding that. Um, and, and uniforms, uniforms and traditions, um, what Richard Holmes, what the late Professor Richard Holmes used to call costume jewellery, all those badges and buttons and um, so on. And just this, marching and a band with, with shiny helmets. Um, this is all history, this is all military history and it's all important stuff. And yeah, we're getting the blurb here that it's, it's having to move. Um, and the music isn't particularly stirring, sadly. The music that goes with this video isn't um, the music of the band that they're marching to. So we've just seen Ajax, brand new armoured vehicle. Um, we're seeing men wearing uniforms that are essentially a hundred years old. Now we're seeing men in the background and women in the background there wearing uniforms that are even older than a hundred years. Um, and I think we're probably up to about 200 years old uh, with lots of what's going on here. And I'm going to pause the video there because I think you're getting the message. Um, that's 200 years of military history. And I think it's brilliant. I'm massively into um, uniforms and tradition and parades and medals and so on. But that's not what I want to talk about tonight. I want to focus it. I want to talk about this. I want to look at um, what, oh, sorry, what we do with military history. Who does it? And are there any problems? I'm going to give you a few examples where I think we don't necessarily get it right. There might be a little bit of so what from that. And then I'll try at the end to link it back into wargaming because that's the, the Fight Club's uh, raison d'etre. Um, I was going to start with a rhetorical question. What is military history? What is the difference between military history, war studies, the history of warfare, uh, and so on? I'm I'm actually not going to try and define it, which is quite unusual for me. Lots of people who know me uh, know that I like specific labels and like to put specific labels on everything. Um, but I haven't fully got my head around um, what the difference is. I'm not sure it really matters too much. I think it's how one uses it uh, that's more important. Um, but I think perhaps in the future, an endorsed understanding of what we, the military, and I count myself as part of it still, we, the military, mean by military history, as applied by defence, could be useful. And um, I don't think he's managed to make it, um, but I was going to say that if Barney was uh, listening in, maybe that's a task for him, I mean this genuinely, when he gets to the Land Warfare Centre. So I want to look at how the army does military history. Um, I was, and occasionally, because I am sort of reserve, still am a soldier, and so that's what I know. And so I'm going to focus on the army. I apologise to anybody from defence industry, uh, the navy, or the air forces out there. I'm going to look at where it fits in traditionally and, and how we use it. And I'll then look at those examples, um, as I've said. So, having said that, I'm going to end with wargaming. I think it's probably also worth starting with wargaming. And, and this is a well-known slide drawn by. Uh, the guru himself, Graham Longley Brown, uh, and taken from his website, there's a similar one in his book, and it shows where wargaming can be used. Uh, and he proposes there are two sides, the analytical or research element on the left as we look, and the training and education on the right. And then he puts those subsets in and he's written wargaming in at the bottom. Well, I reckon you can delete wargaming and insert military history if you use it correctly. Perhaps I should say applied military history. And, and so that's what I'm focusing on now. If I say military history, what I actually mean is applied military history. Military history that's had some thought applied to it, not just something happened. So 
How does the army do military history today? Well, it does it that way. Um, that's the traditional way, battlefield studies. They've changed slightly. Land Warfare Centre added uh, a little bit of a layer of, or uh, well, brought them up to date and added some new words to the AGI. They're now focused training events, which are used to consider operations and campaigns relevant to the unit's role or mission. They're not just a trip somewhere nice. I think they're a brilliant way to learn. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because you might notice that I'm uh, in the picture top right. I think Staff Rides uh, Battlefield Studies can help us understand current doctrine. I think they can help us look at the enduring nature changing character debate. I'm not saying that nature is enduring character is changing. I think they allow us to do that debate. They can help us um, hypothesize a bit about the future conflict. And yeah, I know that's what they used to do more so. Uh, they can help generate that team cohesion and the speed of call. So yes, pop to a cemetery to look at our forefathers. So who have we got on the screen? Top left, um, that's Des Fitzgerald, who is a credited uh, badge Guild of Battlefield Guides guide. He's also listening in tonight. Uh, and on the right, I'm also a badge. There's, there's me in action with some tankies. In the middle, that's the Army Staff Ride from 20. 18, much bigger affair. That was bigger than Ben Hur. That was almost the main effort for 2018. Um, lots of nations, uh, a very different affair. I'm not convinced you learn a huge amount from that. Um, there are lots of people out there who can help with battlefield studies. Um, there are. There's me and others who are listening in who might get a mention in a minute. The academics um, who can help out and regularly do help out. Former military like me who get involved and there are some serving soldiers and 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 for the second time tonight i'm going to mention barney paul barnes um who uh, also takes units on on battlefield studies and he's going to be sat down in the land warfare center um very shortly and will be a, a good contact for people wanting to know more but clearly none of us have been doing much um real battlefield uh, studying uh, out on the ground recently and, and so we've seen the rise of the the virtual uh, battlefield study and there's a screenshot from one commercial offering, um, which I know that the RDG um, used this organization to get out to France yesterday. And the first Fusiliers are heading out to uh, Gallipoli on Monday and the Somme on Tuesday uh, using this. But, and, and I say this next bit as someone who has been the historian on a number of battlefield studies, I'm not convinced we're quite getting it right. And I've got to be careful when I say this, because um, I don't want to do myself out of business. I'm not convinced that the battle of study is always the right way to learn the lessons that one is trying to learn. I think it can help reinforce them. I'm not saying one should stop them, but I'm not suggesting it. I'm not sure it's, it should be the, the one-off event. Right. What else do we do to learn history? Well, we read books. And, and here, here's some random books. Um, Top right, I've gone for, um, because it's the House of Cavalry History, which sort of fits in with the, the video we've, we, we just saw. Um, these are the books you'll get probably in any military library. You'll probably get them in your local library. Next, History of the, uh, the Royal Dragoon Guards. Peter McFarlane, I, I served with. Uh, I know Peter well, and he's a very good man. Um, that will be a cracking little book. And I don't mean that pejoratively or patronising as a little book. I think it's an Osprey series to tell you all about the RDG from um, 1685. Um, next one along. 50th Royal Tank Regiment. Um, again, another very good history. Interesting regiment um, who spent time in the desert and um, Italy and also in um, then dismounted in the Middle East and in the Balkans. And it's great. And on the right, you know, 50 Division land at D-Day uh, on, um, first of all, they're at um, Arras counterattack. They then land on, on, on D-Day. What's not to like about them? But but I'm not convinced that they actually help us answer the questions for the future. They're great stories, but I'm certainly not trying to do them down because I haven't got round to publishing my book, which sort of does what these books do, and I'm now two years overdue. So, so these guys, are, and I think they are all guys in this case, these people are all well ahead of me in the book writing at Skin, but I'm not convinced they give us as analysts, those of us preparing for tomorrow's fight, exactly what we're after. And um, so therefore I think we need something different. And I, I put up six examples there. And I make no apology for putting up any of those books. Um, a couple of the authors of those books are actually listening in tonight. I think three of the authors are listening in. Uh, and a number of them are chums and I put them up there uh, quite through choice. Oh, apart from Matt, 
Matt Ford's book, he bullied me into putting, no, he didn't. I put them up quite deliberately. And I just want to go through why I've chosen um, those six as examples. Um, so six as examples. Um, top left, Amy Fox is learning to fight. Um, a, a cracker of a book. And um, there isn't much out there about learning. And the army has been learning how to fight, either before a fight or during a fight, for quite some time. Amy focuses on 14 to 18 uh, and looks at how we went about it, informal, formal, um, sharing of information uh, around within a theatre and then, of course, um, at other theatres. And if you haven't read it, you, you really must. And I hope Amy's going to do something similar for the 30s uh, and then for the Second World War. If she isn't, she, 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 she needs um, somebody to get hold of her and make her do it. And below that, Fighting the People's War, which to some extent looks at some of that learning. But this is Jonathan Fenner, another academic uh, from King's, who, who looks at the war in the round, I would argue. He's not talking about the fight for the beach at Anzio. He's not talking about how um, Stan Hollis won his VC, both of which are brilliantly interesting um, actions. But Jonathan is looking at, say, in the round, perhaps if you want to do it in modern terms, across d or across the, the components of fighting power. Talking of Dean Lodz, going back up to the top, Churchill Spearhead. Yeah, John's a mate. Um, but this is essentially his PhD put into a book. John's now an academic ex-army officer, uh, now uh, 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 um, teaching at, at the University in Sussex. This book goes through the creation of airborne forces in the Second World War and essentially takes a D Lord approach. And so I think for those of us who are soldiers or in, in, in defence, we understand the framework of D Lords. And this breaks it, this book breaks it down uh, that way. Okay, Weapon of Choice. Now it comes to a slightly embarrassing one. I have bought a copy of Weapon of Choice, um, but I gave it to someone and I, I never got it back. So I haven't read the whole thing. I had a, had a good read of it. Um, Matthew's an academic. Uh, he takes a slightly different look at um, innovation using the vehicle of small arms to explain how we innovate. I was talking to, to Ed and, and, and uh, Arnel at the start. Um, we, different nations have different attitudes um, to weapons for a lot of reasons. National service nations um, design their weapons differently to, to fully professional armies, for example. And I'm not gonna say any more about it, but it looks in detail. It is applied history um, of, of the, uh, it's entirely applied history. And again, worth reading. <clears throat> Top right, Manstein by Mungo. Mungo, Mungo was a general. And I reckon therefore that a general is probably one of the better people to write about a general because they understand the environment. I can talk about up to know, battalion level command because I've been in that environment. It would be very difficult for me to write uh, an applied history book about uh, command at that level because I haven't done it. Mungo has, and so therefore he brings uh, that extra level to it. And, and, and therefore it might not quite hit the definition I gave of applied in the way that that the academics further to the left do, but it brings in that extra dimension, that extra knowledge and understanding, understanding that he has from high command to write the book. And it's that understanding of the environment or the situation bottom right that I think um, Mike Peters' book about glider pilots in Sicily, Mike isn't a glider pilot, uh, but he was in the Army Air Corps. He, he was a crewman rather than a pilot, but he spent a lot of time in the air uh, and he therefore understands air mobility, air manoeuvre, air mindedness, whatever term we're using at the moment. So again, brings a context to bear. Now, those are just um, six books I've chosen, partly because they're chums, partly because a couple of them are listening in. But I just wanted to give an examples of what I mean by um, applied history and what perhaps we should be looking at. I think these are examples. There are thousands of other examples, but which books should we be reading? So, um, and I'll bring that out here. Are we getting it right? And, and, and the sort of questions here, which I won't fully answer, um, but because I've put them up there, I'm suggesting there could be a problem with some of them. Who gets taught military history? Or who, who, gets, who gets the opportunity to study military history as part of their career and then use it to the better of defense? Well, officers predominantly. Majors get a bit on the intermediate course. Those of us who are lucky enough to go on to the advanced course get a bit of it. Um, we might go on a battlefield study. We might be interested. 
but that's a small cohort who are doing it. Perhaps I'm not suggesting we get lance corporals who are brilliant fire team commanders, but but not actually uh, going to be uh, much. Or, no, I don't want to be rude about any particular trade. I was going to say MT, but we probably can't do that anymore. Um, they're not going to be able to understand div level command, perhaps. But maybe we owe them a little bit to get them educated, to get them part of the game. This isn't just officer sport. Um, do we study failure as well as successes? I'm not sure we do. Uh, I've studied, I remember doing it as a, as a young officer, studying the withdrawal from Gallipoli, which was brilliant. But we didn't look at any stage when discussing, well, very briefly, the thing, but we didn't look at why we were having to withdraw, withdraw from Gallipoli. Um, if you're going to talk about Gallipoli, you kind of have to start, well, as I say, in April 1915, probably a bit before. Um, are we overly selective in our case studies? Yes. And I, I'm going to bring this out. I'm going to give you some thoughts about uh, that as we go through. Who writes our reading lists? Yeah, I've given you a reading list. I haven't. I've mentioned six books. So I'm as guilty as whoever reads them, writes them. But our reading lists are written generally by senior officers. And ducks select ducks. Few of them go, oh, look at me, aren't I wacky? I've read this book by blah. But on the whole, look at the Christmas reading list. Look at CGS's reading lists. It's just, they're pretty, um, pretty, they're in a, in a, in a narrow band. Um, ask Amy and Jonathan and, 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 and Matthew for, for, for suggestions, and I think you'll get a better suggestion. So don't get soldiers to write reading lists. Do we study peace as well as war? It's quite hard to study peace. Um, but there's quite a lot of peace between 1919 and 1939. I know a lot of people say that the first will never finish. It was just a pause, but quite a lot of peacetime development goes on. I'll return to that in a bit. Um, and then there has been peace of one variety or another between uh, the end of the First World War, but uh, Second World War, sorry, end of Korea till uh, Stanfast 30 years ago and then uh, 20 years ago. Do we study it as much as we study the war? And my final one, because I don't know if there is anybody in the defence industry, and perhaps this is my, my look at me, I'm available for work. Uh, does the defence industry study military history enough? Um, and if it doesn't, come and chat. So um, I now want to look at how we might do things differently. And I, I couldn't work out a framework for, for this talk. I looked at various options. Uh, on the right, we've got the um, three components of fighting power, the physical, conceptual, moral. On the right, we've got a rather fancy version um, of um, the d lords And, and um, my most initial conclusion from looking at this is that nine, none of them are the perfect framework for anything. Um, second is that, do we have too many frameworks? But that's a, a, another story. So what I'm going to do now is go through using some headings from the, 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 the components of fighting power and all the d lords and look at some areas that I think, and this is just Gareth's daft idea, I think we should be studying um, and who we should be studying and in places why we should be studying that I don't think we're studying quite enough. Uh, and first of all, I'm going to start off with the moral component and the conceptual component, component and a bit into the personnel area, which is not my area of expertise personnel. I've normally I've spent most of my time in the, the training equipment and doctrine uh, DLODs. Uh, clearly, I've spent time in the moral, physical and conceptual components. Um, we study generals a lot. But I wonder how many have, have studied this chap. And I, I hadn't studied him until um, halfway through last year, three quarters of the way through, through last year when it was actually Mike Peters, who's, who's on this uh, webinar, suggested the book. That's um, Sir Roland Adam. Sorry, Ronald Adam. He had been uh, with the BEF in, in, in northern France in 1940, came back, and then in 1941, he became the adjutant general. He stayed as adjutant general uh, until after the war in 1945. And he realized there was a need for the army to change. Yeah, we were at war. And so there was an element of no shit Sherlock about the fact we had to change. Um, but he realized it, it needed to change in a number of ways and it needed to be a, a bit more grown up and a bit more open to the sorts of people we were getting in. And this links to some extent with what Jonathan Fennell says in his book, Fighting the People's War. Um, what did he do that we still know to this day? Well, he brought in some um, aptitude tests for soldiers. Not quite the same as the, the, the barb test, um, but, but the idea, he brought it in. 
Wasby, the War Office Selection Board, came about because of him. It still exists now, the Army Officer Selection Board. Uh, many of those command task type tests uh, and leaderless or with a leader that um, many of us listening in will have done, some more recently than others, they will have been familiar to people in the 40s when he brought it in. He brought about the General Service Corps. Uh, and the General Service Corps still exists. Yeah, I know it's predominantly used for, for, for still soldiers undergoing their initial training and a few sort of key staff appointments become part of it, but he brought that in. He tried, sadly failed, he tried to bring about a corps of infantry. Um, why did he fail? Maybe we should be looking at that. Maybe, maybe the corps of infantry is the wrong answer. Maybe I'm putting the, the, the cart before the horse, but it's being talked about alongside the integrated review and a reduction of the infantry. What did he look at? Why was it discarded then? Oh, there's reasons still valid. Shut up, no core inventory, crack on individual regiments. Or perhaps it's different. So he failed on that one. One area that he didn't fail, and this is a bit controversial. He created a thing called ABCA, not the, 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 the international ABCA, but the Army Bureau of Current Affairs, which provided compulsory learning objectives and material for the whole army. Um, yeah, th th I'd say controversial because there's a suggestion that because of this learning, which all officers were given this material and had to uh, brief to their men, as a suggestion that that helped Attlee uh, win the election uh, in 1945. Well, uh, I don't have a problem with Attlee winning that election because Attlee was a, a South Lanx, East Lanx, served at Gallipoli and then briefly commanded a, a tank corps battalion in 1917 while still a uh, major uh, and then went on in my humble opinion to be a fine uh, prime minister but i'll keep the politics out of it so that was controversial but who's our roland uh, roland ronald ronald adam today who's the ashton general well actually it, it's deputy chief of the general staff it, 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 it's um chris Sakel. um but he's so busy with everything else is he able to to, to focus on adjutant general stuff and i wonder whether um some of what um adam came up with might not be a bad thing to, to, to reinvigorate. Okay, moving on now to the physical component and, and equipment. British Army's got a problem with equipment. Um, yeah, money, money's a lot of it, the problem. Um, but why is money a problem? Partly because it takes so long to get anything to service. And I've been involved in the equipment world. I've been a requirements manager, so you know I'm probably as guilty, but we're not very good at corporate knowledge. It's the unknown knowns, the, 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 the extra bit that, that Rumsfeld didn't talk about. That's not history necessarily, that's, that's, that's knowledge and information, but there is history associated. And uh, one of the people I worked with on the Fres requirement was a history graduate. And do you know what, he paid dividends because he approached it not from a scientific, not worrying about whether it's 10 Newton meters of torque on a road wheel or 12 Newton meters, because there's a scientist out there to do that. He looked at the history of the requirement and whether it had been met or not in the past from a historic perspective. And so um, I think we perhaps need to apply a bit more military history, applied military history to the equipment area. Um, what are those two tanks? Well, you look at bottom right, it's clearly a, a Panther prototype. What's top left? Well, that's also a Panther prototype. Um, which one of those? Those are competing prototypes. They both did what um, the German requirement said they should do. Top left probably did it rather better than bottom right. Why wasn't top left chosen? Because it didn't look German enough. And to be honest, it looks a bit like a T-34, which is what the Soviets had. And so the bottom one came, uh, was chosen. That in itself was not necessarily a bad choice, but the changes that were then made to the requirement, which I would argue is what priced Fres UV out of the market in 2010, um, changes the requirement, it was, it was changed left, right and centre, created um, what should have been an excellent tank, the Panther, but when it first saw uh, action in 1943, it was actually a very poor tank, both in design terms and, and across the D-Lots. But I think the history of this design of the Panther tank is worthy of study by people in the equipment area. That's a CVR, that's a Scorpion in, um, it's not in a rubber plantation in Malaya, um, that's actually in Belize. But uh, so that dates it. They've got bone, they've got crew guard, uh, but it's a scorpion. So it's somewhere between 88 and 91. And um, lots of people say, why is a scorpion that size? Ah, because it was, it was, it, the requirement was it had to fit there in a rubber plantation in, in Malaya. 
I don't think that's true. Um, the same historian who was helping on the Fresno client went and found out. Um, I, I didn't write it down, uh, but I'm pretty sure it was because you had to fit two of these in one of the cargo aircraft. Now, the net result may be similar, um, but knowing what drove it a certain way, no pun intended, is probably no bad thing. Quiz time. What vehicles are those and what year are we talking about? Right, well, sadly, can't do an interactive quiz, and I suspect most of you know the answer. Well, the first thing is that, that they're all the same vehicle in the same location, only they've got different names. On the left, we've got MRAV, multi-role armoured vehicle, um, in a bank 2000-2001 at the then Alvis Vickers plant. Um, in the middle, that's the Fres utility vehicle, Fres UV, in about 2007. Alvis Vickers had gone and BA Systems had, had appeared. And there on the right, that's MIV, the mechanized infantry vehicle. I mean, all of them are boxer. It's the same platform. Um, and we've been in part in that program since, well, 2001, we, we pulled out of it. We went back in with Frayers. We came out of it. We're now going back in with MIV. Um, I'm not trying to give you a history of the boxer development here. Uh, the reason I put this up is that um, there were some very useful historical reasons. There's some very, history would have helped us understand the reasons that caused us to drop out of the program at each stage. Now, just a word of caution. For those of you who might find yourself in one of these in the future, I reckon it's a cracking vehicle. And so the fact that we could have had it 20 years ago and we're only getting it now or, or soon should not put anybody off. I'm not criticizing the vehicle. What I'm criticizing is how we've used history or not used history in this case um, to develop a vehicle. And on that sort of slightly stretching uh, applied history a little bit, if you want to ever look at um, something which isn't funny, but actually is a little bit funny uh, about changing requirements and poor acquisition, um, have a look at the Pentagon Wars. I hadn't watched it before. There's a there's a trailer, a three minute trailer on um, YouTube. Just watch the three minute trailer rather than the hour 45. But um, if you are going to watch the full thing, concentrate on the opening scenes where some American tanks in the 1930s are doing some pretty horrendous things which would have hurt the crew. Uh, but it's worth a watch. It, it shows you it's fiction, but uh, there's a truth to it. Right, let's get back onto some serious history. Let's now get into, again, can't pin it down exactly to a component or um, a D-LOD, so it's sort of the physical component, its organisation and its equipment. And the example I've got for you here is an Indian Divisional Recce Regiment in India. Now, you might be tempted to say, and I wouldn't disagree with you, blimey, that's a lot of different vehicles. I wouldn't want to be the QM tech. And I absolutely agree with that point. Nowadays, this is a no-no. You don't want this many types. But the reason I put it up is to show the different capabilities that that regiment had. How did it end up having those capabilities? Was it designed to have them from the start or did they grow? And how did they work out? Because actually, having said, we don't want that many different vehicles, we may not want that many different vehicles, but we might need all of those capabilities. Um, doesn't look too dissimilar to a Formation Recce regiment. They've got an RHQ troop, comms troop there. They had some fire support. Okay, it was GW. They didn't have mortars. They had armored cars in the um, uh, squadrons, jeeps providing armored cars, and they had their own support troop. Um, not quite as large as that. And there are parallels. Has anybody ever analyzed this? Now, okay, this is niche, um, and, it, and it is a bit of a, a, a hobby horse. Sorry, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by. Um, uh, the whole Italian campaign and the Indian role in it, and, and these guys in particular. Um, because they were cavalry regiments working for infantry uh, divisions. But there's another thought. Have we looked at the history of mounted regiments? Because these guys only gave up their horses in about 1939. And we're in this formation actually from 43, four years later. Have we looked at the mounted mindset versus the dismounted mindset? Perhaps it doesn't matter. Perhaps it's irrelevant. But I wonder whether this might provide uh, an area of study. Right. OK, so again, what do I want here? Conceptual or doctoring equipment? Because it's a bit of everything. Um, because Batman, Hobo, Percy Hobart, idolised by, by quite a few. 
What did he do? Well, in 1944, he solved the most neatly bounded military problem ever given to a two star. And he still couldn't do his pocket up. He had to come up with a plan to get people off the beaches. And that was it. And that's what 79th Division did. I mean, they did it very well. Um, and they came up with some fantastic kit. And yeah, I'm being very, very unfair on him and the men of 79th Armoured Division. But it was a fairly tightly bounded uh, problem. What had he done before um, 79th Armoured Division? Well, he got sacked, didn't he? He got sacked from 1st Armoured Division, and, and I think quite rightly so. Why do I say that? Well, I think he messed up in the 30s. I've gone back to the 30s. I think we should all be studying the 30s. Um, uh, there's a couple of people listening in who know uh, much more about it than I do. Des, it's you know, one, for example. And But the 30s, we were going through a not dissimilar situation to what we're facing now and um we had the dilemma of looking trying to look forward by but being influenced by the past which is what war games so it does and what military history is about and he screwed up the organization of an armored div um he wanted tanks only um and, and a number of tankies and i'm a tank a number of tankies became far too evangelical and just basically the answer is tanks now what's the question and and, and he was wrong um, he also said that the two-pounder gun was probably enough, uh, and he was wrong on that. Uh, and so I have a bit of a downer on um, uh, Percy Hobart, but but he made two-star and I made OF4, so um, shut up, Lewis. Uh, again, conceptual component doctrine, and again the 1930s, although the photos are going to show them uh, a little bit later in the 40s. Who are those two? Well, the Canadians, for starters. They're not British. Um, and I think that's why they're really interesting to study. Um, don't have the same size professional army. On the left is Tommy Burns, on the right is Guy Simmons. Uh, very different characters, um, but are both absolutely involved in the debate about combined arms warfare, mechanised armoured warfare. And when I say armoured, I do mean combined arms in the 1930s. So again, another reason to study the 1930s. I'm not going to say which of them was right. I'm also going to not, not going to say which of them was a better leader or at, at sort of GOC and core commander level. One was, and, 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 but go and read about them. Because I think what you'll find when you analyse it, absolutely fascinating, and it has, I think, relevance today. Still on doctrine, because I do love a bit of doctrine. I don't read that. That's, that's um, ADP land ops. That's... The, 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 that's the, the pages from chapter six on um, Mission Command. Mission Command is right, relatively new, isn't it? 1990s, isn't that when it came in? I remember being taught it. Nah, it's not new. Field Service Regulations on the left, 1912, and on the right, 1935. And I think the 1912 is actually a, an updated version of the 1909. So we're kind of at 110 years old. And the bit of I highlighted. A departure from either the spirit or the letter of an order is justified if a subordinate who assumes responsibility bases his decision on some fact which could not be known when the, issue, the order was issued. And actually, the one below is probably more important, which I probably should have highlighted, number three, and it's probably clearer on the right. If a subordinate neglects to depart from the letter of his orders when such departure in the circumstances of subpara two above is clearly demanded, he will be held responsible for any failure that may ensure. So not only did we have mission command before the First World War, and so before the Second World War, so that if you found yourself facing a situation which wasn't what your boss expected, and therefore you had to work out what to do, which would be different to what you've been told to achieve your boss's mission, the outcome. First of all, it was in the doctrine. Second, it was very clear if you didn't do it, you're in the wrong. Um, and so people who say, um, didn't have it until the 1990s. Well, I would argue it's wrong. And there are some good examples throughout First World War, let's say Second World War, of mission command coming in, which are never used as examples of mission command. Yes, I know that the current version looks at why, how you build mission command, trust and mutual understanding and all of that stuff. But in terms of explaining it, maybe um, the history is worth looking at to understand how we got to where we are now. And to me, looking at doctrine and understanding what was written and why, and what was continued in examples, that to me is applied history. 
Okay, let's get on to some battles and some wars and some warfare, because in many ways that's that's really what we think about with, with military history. And I want to start with the English Civil War in, in 1643. And um, that's the Battle of Railway Down, which is just above Devizes. And the blue forces are the Royalists, who basically come down from Oxford uh, to join up with, um, oh, I've noticed Devizes stopped wrongly, um, Hopton, on the bottom, who is who's sort of hunkered down, besieged in devises. So infantry down in devises, um, cavalry come down from Oxford and, and take on uh, the parliamentarians who have set themselves out, uh, according to the doctrine, um, on roundway down, using cavalry either side, the, the horse and caresses, there's a picture of caresses there, and um, 3,000 infantry in the middle. Look at the numbers. 5,000 defending, 1,800 attacking. That's the wrong way around. That's one to three, which is never going to work. The parliamentarians have deployed in the doctrine of the day. They've done what you'd be expected to do. Dudes on the right, uh, the royalists, come down and, and, and absolutely stuff them. Um, why did the a parliamentarian doctrine fail? Again, I'm not going to tell you. Um, I think it's something that is worth looking at. And I think it does have some parallels. I'm not suggesting that the battle overall equates to a combined arms manoeuvre, but I think the understanding of the application of tactics is worth looking at. Right, leaping forward rapidly. Oh, come on, Andre. That's Beersheba on the left, um, the town of the Seven Wells in around uh, 1915. And on the right, that's some. Um, that's a digger. That's an Aussie, Aussie light horseman on his whaler. And in 1917, um, Beersheba was attacked. And look at the map on the right first. Um, the, the, the Ottomans were aligned in defences from the um, 10 o'clock round through the 6 o'clock all the way up to the 2 o'clock, essentially. And, and what happened was the British attacked with two infantry divisions uh, from the west, uh, from the at the nine o'clock which came in, took the first defences, um, and then the mounted troops did a big sweep counterclockwise to the south and fought a battle up at Tel Sheba. And then we're gonna send, uh, so the mainly New Zealanders with the Australians, and then they were gonna send the yeomanry in uh, to attack uh, into the village, into the town. It was more of a village then. But they didn't send the infantry in, uh, sorry, the yeomanry in. Um, Chauvel, the man in charge, an Aussie, sent the Australian light horse. They're not cavalry. They're infantrymen who can fight from the horse and from uh, the, they're, they're, they're mounted soldiers who can fight dismounted, but they don't have a sword. Um, they've got bayonets. That photo was staged uh, after the event, if you're wondering how it came about. It was staged not long after and apparently gives a good representation. So why didn't Chauvel use um, the yeomanry? Well, there's some very good social reasons why he didn't. He was an Aussie. This is his background. These are the people he knew. He trusted them. But actually, there's also uh, a military uh, reason for, for, for um, um, allowing, uh, sending them because the yeomanry were um, off saddled somewhere to the south or a bit far away. Uh, and so um, it, it would have been quicker. Why do I talk about that little action? Because what I've been hinting at as I go through is that we, we, perhaps we shouldn't focus on, on actions, small little actions, because on their own, they don't mean anything. So if we zoom out and look at Beersheba, which is down here, the number one, at the start of the autumn, winter 17 campaign, which then goes on through 18 up to uh, the north of Palestine and on into Syria, and look at the personalities, look at the forces involved, look at who the commanders were, where they came from and their allegiances, we get a better understanding of why things happened the way they did. As an aside, um, and I know Amy um, has used this campaign uh, with her students at the Staff College. It's a cracking campaign to study. Land component, um, air component, maritime component, um, quite an SF component, but you've got irregular forces, huge logistic effort. Um, you've got uh, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, West Indies, people from the West Indies. You've got um, some Fijian boatmen. You've got predominantly territorial force, and you've got people who fought at Gallipoli or Salonica or both. And it, it's sort of got the mix of everything uh, and it's a cracking campaign study. And I think there are lots of lessons 
um, that come out of this. But you can't just study a little bit of it. You've got to study the whole campaign. Right, what's been missing so far? Um, tanks. Uh, and as most of you know, I do quite often say a day without a tank is a day wasted. Uh, and today is, is not a day to be wasted. Um, top right, tanks um, with the fascines on. The scenes of British response to the German response to the British using tanks. British, you first used tanks in 1916, they crossed the trenches. Germans went, yeah, we've got you here, Brits, make the trenches wider. So the Brits worked out a way of putting something in the trench to cross them. Uh, bottom left is um, a graphic um, from a, a book um, by a, a book on the, an Osprey series book on the Battle of Cambrai, actually um, authored by um, Alexander Turner who is uh, Alexander Turner DSO, who is now Commander 77 Brigade. Um, and I would say a, a noted military historian who understands both the narrative and the applied. Um, he's also one of these madmen who goes underground in, in, in tunnels on the Durham group, which makes him a bit crazy. Um, great, tanks. What do we think about Cornbread? It was all about tanks. And, and here's the plan. Hindenburg, you don't need to know the detail. Hindenburg line, big German, German defensive. Um, tanks and infantry break through the Hindenburg line. Hurrah. Caesar crossings, and they do. Cavalry, yeah, go for the GN gap. Off they go, and then some other stuff will happen, and we'll we'll clear up. And um, cavalry, uh, cavalry is a great battle to study. Um, certainly, with my tanky head on, though, we we generally only study the first day. Uh, maybe a couple of later days, up to about the twenty fifth of November, up here in Bourlon or, or Fontaine Notre Dame. Um, we tend to avoid this area on the sort of 28th, 29th, 30th of December, um, and, and then heading into uh, in December, uh, November, heading into December, because the Germans counterattacked, because we failed, and, and, and that's a bit of a failure. Um, what do we focus on when we talk about Cambrai? Tanks, and quite rightly so, 450 or so go into action that day, the most we've ever put in. But I'm gonna get probably drummed out of the RTR by saying this, but um, Cambrai is not a tank battle. Cambrai is an artillery battle. Cambrai is a battle where new artillery, artillery techniques are used for the first time and used very successfully. Um, yeah, they, they need some modification. And once they're launched, it all becomes a, a bit difficult to, to change things. But if you don't study the artillery at Cambrai, you've kind of missed a significant amount of Cambrai out. And if you don't study Cambrai from the planning from, from, from Third Eep, all the way through certainly 31st of July, a um, little bit of August, and then on into right into the start of December, you're not going to get the full story. And I, I'm as guilty, or my, my, my cat page is guilty of not studying the whole thing. We like to, uh, to sniff it. I'm giving a talk, I'm giving a virtual battle for talk, Combray, uh, soon, where I will focus on successful bits. That's a civilian audience. Right, let's push forward. Um, 80 years ago, um, today, we just finished uh, fighting down at better form on the left-hand side of the map. Uh, we'd come a long way. We started that offensive uh, with Wavell in charge on, on the 9th of December in reaction to some, some um, Italian incursion into Egypt. Uh, and then we pushed them out and we kept going. And we kept going because we could. Uh, I think we hadn't planned to keep going quite as far, but we used momentum, which, of course, was challenging because on equipment capabilities, uh, equipment support side of life and the wider um, G4 logistic effort, it significantly challenged us. But look at the distances. And I want to focus on um, the distances from here to Brook, 22nd of January, which took a couple of days to take. So, you know, to Brook LRM, we're still here sort of 24th, 25th of um, um, January. By the 3rd of Feb, we've come up somewhere around here, or the Italians have come back to here, we're still around here. But by the 7th of Feb, 5th of Feb here, and the 7th, we're, we're duffing up the Italians here. Um, there's a scale 100, so what is that? Um, 100, 200, 250, 300 miles. And it was a, blimey, let's go for it. <clears throat> and off we went. And um, because of the terrain, and because of the differing speeds, wheels took one route, and tracks took another route. Um, I'd love to see this modelled, studied, and, and applied to strike, um, because I think there might be some interesting lessons to be learned. Right, pushing on. 
Normandy. We've all been to Normandy and the landings were pretty amazing. And standing on some of those beaches, uh, whether it be uh, Sword thinking about the, the 30th, 18th coming ashore with their DD tanks or over on um, Omaha doing your pro Saving Private Ryan bit, it's pretty amazing. Um, but how often do we get away from the beaches? Not often enough, I would argue. Okay, I'm being, I'm being a bit unfair because that is a slide from the battlefield study that you saw a photo of me um, involved in earlier um, for Cyclops Squadron of the uh, RTR. Um, and I took them, we looked at Op Perch, Op Epsom and Op Goodwood. So um, we got away from the beaches, um, we got down there and I would argue that a bit of time on the beaches and then those three operations with a little bit of symmetry action thrown in and a night out in call, that, that makes a pretty good battlefield study. But is limiting yourself to those bits of ground um, really making the best use of history and best use of ground? Oh, but that's quite a bit of ground, isn't it? Or is it? Have any of you ever heard anybody complain that Salisbury Plain is too small? You can't manoeuvre on Salisbury Plain. Well, that's the same scale map. Those are exactly the same size blobs transplanted, so perch, um, Epsom and um, Goodwood transplanted onto the map. And yeah, okay, you'd have to take the left hand one and, 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 and turn it through 45 degrees. But I reckon you've got Salisbury Plain west, centre and east there. So if that's what we're looking at there, perhaps we're guilty of not getting out on the ground as much as we could. So get out, go and look further afield. There's a heck of a lot more. Um, blue coat, totalized, tractable, there are others. Uh, all in this area here, the, the, the sort of late July, August, what's going on? Uh, and if that's not studied, I'm not talking about going there, I'm talking about studying them as part of the wider campaign. If you're not getting out there and studying them, I think you're missing a trick. Let's leap across the other side of, of Europe to the Eastern Front. That's Kursk in um, summer of 1943. Just look at the numbers there. Um, each one of those Russian groups is two or 300,000, um, sorry here, Soviet, two or 300 or 400,000 men. 1,600 tanks, 1,500 tanks, 1,700 tanks, 1,700 tanks. You do the math, as, as the Americans will say. Um, huge amounts of, 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 of tanks, troops and guns involved, um, but rarely studied as an action in its own right, partly because getting accurate history has been difficult, and, and even less studied as part of, well, that's 1941. Look at how much ground was involved. And there was a lot of fighting that went on in there, a lot of combined arms actions that went on uh, with all the challenges that we would face today. Yeah, okay, they didn't have Bowman and all of that, and therefore we can't equate all of them. But do we look at this campaign? Yeah, we focus on Moscow, we didn't get there. And then we focus down here, where is it? Um, Stalingrad, I've lost it, but it doesn't really matter. It's somewhere down here. Um, <clears throat> do we concentrate? we concentrate on those? We don't look at the bits in between. Um, biggest tank battle of the war wasn't Kursk, I reckon it was Brody, which is around here in, in Ukraine. Do we ever study that? No. And then going the other way, <clears throat> Soviet actions from 43 on to 45. Yeah, we, we go to the um, Silao Heights and it's great. And sometimes we go as far as Pozen. Um, yeah, we can't go to these places, but we can study them, the whole thing. And that's sort of what I'm getting trying to get at. Um, and then post Normandy. What do we look at? Oh yeah, we go up here, don't we? Um, where is it? Market Garden, up here. Uh, and I'm certainly not saying don't study Arnhem. I've, I've taken groups for Arnhem. It's cracking study. But I'm saying don't study in isolation. Um, and the same is true from early 1945. But I don't think we look at them, partly because getting there to do it for real takes a little bit longer. So don't go there. Do the study to learn from it to help us for the fight tomorrow without going there. There's plenty of other ways of doing it. Um, what am I talking about? Um, on the left, Operation Blackcock, do, genuinely here, be careful when Googling for it, as I found out. Um, on the right, um, Veritable in the top right. Look at where the start line for Veritable is. That's Grosbeak. The Americans were there in September. And this is February. It's the same bit of ground we're starting from. Do they link together? What were we doing in between? How come it took us till then? Yes, some of you know that, but I think it's probably worth studying formally. And finally, and thanks to, to Neil Blenkinsop uh, for, for reminding me of this, and I think Neil's listening in actually. Um, 
has anyone studied what was going on in parallel to the drive up to the Lunenburg Heath? Because this is this is where we end up. This is where Monty signs the surrender up on the, the Salto, the Lunenburg extension just off at the Salto training area that some old soldiers listening in might remember. Did we study what was going on in parallel? What was that? Well, a team of planners were looking at the what do we do when we cross the Rhine? What do we do once the war ends? Did anybody study that in 2002 or 2003? Um, I, I don't know if the lessons would have been the same, um, but I just wonder whether some study or understanding of history might have helped us. And so that sort of takes me to, 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 towards the end and I've gone one slide on. So I'm just gonna go back and, and I thought I had a blank and I, I failed you. So having said some of those things about perhaps we should be studying this, what else should we be studying? Well, I'm not gonna answer you um, other than what I've suggested so far. I'm not gonna tell you what to study because that would be me giving a reading list and it would be as skewed as, as any of those reading lists that you get from a, a senior officer. Um, okay, I, I am gonna offer some ideas. Um, I think look some east, look perhaps back in history. When talking about leadership, look at some different leaders. Look at Salah Adin. I know that ICSL did bring in a Salah Adin as a, um, a leadership study in about 2011, but it taken a number of years. It was the traditional uh, Montes and Hagues and, 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 and opposing generals until then. Um, um, perhaps look at the development of warfare from 1850. There are a number of sort of chunks, 1850 to the First World War, the interwar period. Oh, I'm back to the 30s again. I'm quite excited by the 30s. I really think the British Army should be studying the 30s more. Um, perhaps Second World War and then into the, the post-war world is worth studying. What I think I'm suggesting is, is what another clever man, not me, but clever man, another clever man I'm quoting from, um, David Morgan Owen, um, wrote in a, in a cracking little article for, for Rusi recently, that we need to get away from operational insights. We need to get away from trying to justify contemporary preoccupations. Um, these are things that, that people like Barney and others on, on Twitter would talk about presentism, neophilia, and other words, which I had to sort of check with Barney today because I didn't quite follow them. But stop looking at those snippets, look in the round, do the analysis. And so rather clunkily, and with, with, with just a few minutes to go, that brings me back to Wargaming and, and you, the Fight Club community, plus a few hangers on who've come in uh, 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 because uh, I mentioned it to them. Um, historical now that's a slide taken from the Land Warfare Centre. Um, it's not my slide, that's theirs, about, uh, as you can see, methods of analysis and experimentation. And Fight Club, I reckon you sit in the middle. Um, and replicating what's going on on the right. Um, the left-hand side, that's, that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, and I think we have, uh, those of us who spend more of our time on the left than in the middle, have an equal role to play. And in fact, I think we need to cross over more. Forget the field experimentation, that, that, that's what real soldiers are doing. But I think the modeling and gaming element, and the historical analysis, I think uh, there should be more crossover. And I wonder whether some of the uh, military historian chums, soldier historians, um, who, who've joined the chat tonight might want to sign up to Fight Club and get involved in some of the, the fighting, some of the games, um, because I think they have something to offer. So um, I think wargaming can find itself in a similar situation. It's not used in quite such an enlightening way as it might be. What Fight Club is doing is brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm hugely envious. I tried to get somebody interested in something similar in about 13 or 14 failed misery. What Arnell and, 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 our, and the gang have done is, is and it has been a team effort, um, have done it, I think is superb. Um, I, I think they could do better. That's not a criticism of that. I think they could be harnessed better. Um, and I think one or two people getting that as, as, as their mainstream job, rather than have to do day jobs, uh, would help. But I think we need to make sure we start our current choice or predicament um, and, and analyze the historical record whether it be through modeling gaming, through historical analysis, to, to, to provide that perspective, to stimulate the imagination, to find the clues about what's going to happen, um, to suggest some possible interventions and assess those um, probable consequences. And once we've done that as historical analysis, perhaps we should then test them out in one of the Fight Club's contested war games. Um, that's my final slide. I was going to use the, the drunk and the lamppost that we use that we should be using 
military history and applied history, um, not in the way that the drunk uses the lamppost for support, but for illumination. Um, I'm saying we need to take our uh, military history light to where it's needed. Um, and I hope you are able to take your games and the light from them to where that is needed. And I'm going to stop there, which is pretty amazing that we're um, two minutes off uh, an hour. Um, you couldn't have planned it better, Gareth, could you? And hand over to Arnold. Gareth, uh, that was really splendid and lots of gold dust in there for, for us to all take away. Um, so thank you so much for that. And we got some good questions here that are coming in um, on Slido. And what I asked, if, if, if you do have a microphone, you know, I'd rather you ask this question live. Um, if you can, if not, I'll ask it for you. And we'll start with, uh, if I'm saying it right, Marin Walters, I think I just read your article on Wable Room. It's really good about using proper English better or plain English. Marin, yeah. do you have a microphone? Can you ask your question? Yes, I do. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Gareth, the value of applied history is not for debate, but who needs re-exposure to that value to increase the appetite for better, more widespread learning? Um, simple answer, the army. Um, expanded answer, all of the army, not just officers. Um, and um, I think we just need to be cleverer about it, uh, Merrin. I think it... Um, I think we think by doing something like looking at, I don't know, um, the Battle of Umboto Gorge, we're being really clever because we've studied something from history and therefore we must be learning something for the future. And the way in which historical study is conducted, and this is not meant as a sales pitch for people like me or as a criticism of the current um, Agai, but with the way that it's moved to units pushed to do their own battlefield studies, whether on the ground or at home, I think we're more of a danger of trying something because we think it's clever rather than actually thinking about what we're trying to achieve. And I think it absolutely links with your article on, on, on language. And you know, I, I, I have a little bit of a thing about language. And um, I just um there. I'm, I'm hoping I didn't get too flowery or carried away or, or, or jargony in my talk. Do beat me over the head if I did. So I, I think the army needs to look wider at professional military education. I don't like the term PME. And I, I, I tried to start a bit of a fight on Twitter today by saying PME isn't just military history. It's not. Um, and I've just seen something from, from, from Matt Ford. He's teasing me on questions. I, I think the army needs to think a bit more widely about what it is trying to achieve from military history. I think the basics are there. Um, I think the interest is there and, um, and use it in a more applied way. Don't just do history. Going to a military cemetery is not applied military history. Thank you. Thanks, Marion. We really, we really did like your article and Ed had cited me on it and shared, we shared it pretty widely. Um, <laughs> let's go to... Um, Julian Sio, Daniel, do you have your microphone that you can unmute and uh, ask your question live? Just give you a second here. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, oh, so basically, go. Go ahead. my question is, um, I'm interested in your point about the military history being an officer sport. Um, and I find that especially at work a lot. But uh, how can we engage it with junior NCOs? Uh, as often in my experience, they're the tip of the spear. Uh, and they're usually the guys on the um, out on the ground. They need to probably, they can probably get more out of it than most. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know the answer. I think by having more people like you, Daniel, um, asking that question will be a start. Um, what I don't need the cat badge, but which, which bit of the army are you in, just out of interest? So um, intelligence corps, but with a 16-hour assault brigade, so that's OK. Um, well, I would get 16-hour assault brigade to read John Greenacre's book for a start. Uh, and now I'm not on commission. Um, I don't even know if it's still in print. There'll be a copy in the, the Colchester Library. I think... I think all of us who are involved in the game of um, developing or preparing for tomorrow's war, whether it be you as a serving junior NCO who clearly has um, an operational role and a focus, doing everything we can to prepare ourselves the best. And that might not actually use a huge amount of military history at all levels. It might actually be making sure that Lance Corporal Davis from, from Two Para, um, this Davis would never have made it 
into the parachute regiment in, in any rank. But let's say Lance Paul Davidson, two para, probably doesn't need to know a huge amount about history, but he does need to know a bit, quite a little bit about giving orders. But then we need to get it permeating. So if we don't start with Lance Paul Davis, suddenly he's a sergeant. And suddenly he's a color sergeant, a sergeant major, and his experience of history is, um, well, let's pick a cavalry regiment, Balaclava Day, and it's a big, it, it's a good chance to drink, and a drumhead service, and uh, maybe some skits in the science mess, and, uh, or if you're a tanky, uh, uh, some skits in the officers versus um, Warren Officer and CNSU um, uh, football match, when an officer always breaks his leg. And that's brilliant, but that's not military history. That is the history of the unit. It's certainly not applied military history. So um, I haven't answered your question. In fact, I've avoided answering your question, not deliberately, Daniel, but um, I don't know the answer. I think we need to have more junior NCOs, senior NCOs, warrant officers engaged with it and selling the story. I think um, people like me, when we get involved with studies, whether actually on the battlefields or um, in camp or over um, uh, remote means, if there are junior NCOs who want to learn more, that we give them that time to help them learn a bit more, give them some pointers. Um, I think probably some some overhaul of, of military education is, is is needed, but I don't think that's going to happen for quite some time. Um, hopefully, that's vaguely answered your question. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Uh, thank um, you, Daniel. No, thanks very much. That's really interesting. The only thing I'd add to that is is that from my experience is that. Is often considered officer sport mainly because it, it fits into the officer role quite well, um, and it helps their reporting and it helps their <laughs> the sense of their um, getting in with the CEO and that sort of stuff. But for a junior okay. NCO, especially yeah, in my yeah, role, right. had, had no value. You're right, but but I think the officers need educating in this, and so um, I, I probably was as guilty. Um, the battlefield study I took Cyclops um, squadron of the RTR on. Um, we were looking, Cyclops, the third squadron, so it was predominantly three RTRs actions, which is therefore why we were looking at, we looked at a bit of one RTR, Perch, Epsom and, and Goodwood. Um, that tour, I was the historian, academic, whatever you want to call it, I um, did that bit, but the tour, in terms of working out where we were going to go, um, which stands, and all the admin was conducted by a corporal and a trooper. Now, they were slightly different to some, but that, the corporal just had an interest. He'd been on one of Sticky Whitchurch's generic tours of, 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 of Normandy, and, and he just remembered where they'd been, and so he used that as a template. The trooper, although a tank driver, he had a degree in military history, um, and he's now a police officer in, in Kent. So, yes, they were, they were perhaps not your mainstream, but give the task to a, a corporal and a sergeant to organise a battlefield study. Um, don't give it to the junior officer because there's plenty of things that a junior officer or a subject commander can do uh, to be tested in an MS moment. I took the Light Dragoons out two years ago and I spoke to the commanding officer, uh, um, uh, Tom Robinson, who's out in um, Tom Robinson, who's out in um, Mali at the moment with his regiment. And I said to him, you know, um, is this a test for your squadron leader? And he said, Oh God, no, this is this is just one small little thing. Um, if I want to test my squadron leaders, I wouldn't get them a battlefield study to run. I've got much more important things to, to test them with. And so <clears throat> I think we need to break out of that idea. And well, they are, uh, Daniel, volunteer to put on a 16 brigade uh, battlefield study, whether it's in camp, virtual or uh, on the ground. That's the way to do it. Thanks, Daniel. And you can see from the comments that had posted in there, you know, that, you know, take charge of some toots, integrate them. And what's good about some of the tools we're using in Fight Club, like you can, you can do them, you know, digitally, virtually, yeah. and then get out there on the ground. So we're, we're being more dynamic with the way we, we do this. Um, so speaking of virtual, I'll just go ahead and push to uh, Vish, one of our, our most, one of our very active Fight Club members. Vish, do you have a mic? Can you ask your question live? Hey, um, I've, I just wanted to ask you, um, where did you have your favorite virtual battlefield tour? And um, would you recommend it to others? Okay, I am not, I have a commercial interest in the organization that is delivering the virtual battlefield tours that I mentioned earlier. I'm therefore not going to take any questions on the virtual battlefield tours because I think that would be unfair because of my commercial linkage to it. Um, is there I can any way? Talk about my favorite battlefields to study, 
from a personal perspective, but I'm going to keep the virtual bit out of it, if I may, please, Vish. Uh, that's all right, yeah. Um, I appreciate the, the conflict of interest. So, I mean, In terms of battlefields to study, from a personal perspective, so battlefield study rather than battlefield talk, because the military does battlefield study. I'm not trying to be an, an, an RC pedant there to you, um, but but they are, they are different things. Battlefield study at all would be going to look at some cemeteries and, and some museums and so on. Battlefield study is where we do the analysis and therefore feed back in to um, helping us fight tomorrow's fight. So um, personal favourites, frankly, um, Italy from, from, from toe to, to top, because um, you can throw in a bit of Second World War all the way through and then you can throw in a bit of First World War up in Asiago. Uh, or the Palestine campaigns. I was lucky to, to spend some time working out there, so, so I got to study them in quite some detail because they were on my doorstep. So those are personal favourites. But in, in terms of learning, any of the ones I've mentioned today, you can learn, but look at the whole campaign. Don't just go to the battlefield. So perhaps we need to change the term. Perhaps battlefield study is the, the wrong word. A bit like wargaming might be the wrong word, but that's another thesis that I, I went, boy, perhaps we should be looking at, I don't know, terrain talk i don't know or campaign talk anyway i can't answer that so fish sorry i haven't answered your question i can if you want to get hold of me some other time i can do the marketing uh, spiel for you but I, I don't think it's fair for me to do it on here thank you sir yeah appreciate it hey thanks fish um let's go to uh another fight club member ollie elliott ollie are you you out there make you turn off your can you unmute yeah thanks oh, thank uh, you. yeah uh gareth thanks so much for that lecture it's really interesting um so you seem to be proposing that for uh, to be able to use history to learn as a military, what you need is someone to say what the learning objectives are, and then to specifically go to an area or so in the reading, not physically go somewhere, but you know you then need to specifically look at a certain action or campaign to learn from it, having specifically chosen what the training objectives will be. Do you therefore think that learning from history is beyond the ability? of a unit and they will always require a military historian to guide them in what they need to be reading? Not necessarily, but there are plenty of military historians that defence can call upon for free, quite cheaply, cost or quite cost effectively. So I, I won't say cheaply. Um, Sandhurst, um, Peter McCutcheon was on the line. I think Peter's still part of the, the Sandhurst team. He, he, he and the gang up there, um, um, and Stuart Mitchell and people can certainly give advice beforehand. Um, the King's Gang, uh, the KCL team, they, they can give advice. Um, they need paying if you need them to do stuff for you, because nothing in this life is really free. They're not quite in the same contract, whereas Sanders are, are belong to defence in, in a way that perhaps KCL don't. Um, the Land Warfare Centre has a historical analysis team. It's, it's, it's one man and a dog. Um, actually, that's unfair. On the, the dog is a, has a PhD, uh, has written a book about the, the British Army in, in Mesopotamia in the First World War. So that's very, very unfair of me to, to, to call him that. But they are, uh, to, to refer to Paul as a dog, they're, they're very small, uh, but they have contacts. And you know, the number of them are sitting in on this, um, um, what is it, a webinar, this, this talk. So whether it's me, Des Fitzgerald, Mike Peters, other academics are out there, um, will always chip in. Um, so I think you can find it out. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely understand your campaign, a good question. Um, if you want somebody to write, run field firing properly, they need a stage five qualification, which you don't just tip up, do the course and go away with a certificate. You, you come to it with um, experience in rank and time on the ranges. Well, there's an argument the military is not dissimilar you need somebody who has studied it for some time and can apply it to that situation. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think units can all do it on their own. I think they probably do need external assistance, but I don't think that's a problem because I think the external assistance can be got in a cost effective manner and can help a unit significantly, Ollie. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Gareth. That was a really helpful answer. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. And so next question, Gareth, is from, uh, I think he's a mate of yours, Dr. Matt Ford. I haven't talked to him in a while. Uh, Matt, can you unmute and uh, you got an excellent question there. Give Gareth I, a hard time with this one. Thanks, um, Arnell. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, I haven't see seen you in ages, but it's good to see you. Gareth, lovely to see you too. I'm sorry I haven't got my party uh, hat on for you, Matt. <laughs> 
no, in joke, a, sorry. It's a, lovely, it's, a, it's a lovely backdrop anyway. Um, and my question is a bit teasy, but not yeah. really, it's, it's teasy only on the basis that, you know, me, Merrin, uh, uh, Ollie Kingsbury all had a Twitter conversation about the language being used in, uh, which I think resulted in the Wubble Room. Uh, Merrin <laughs> took all of those thoughts and very wisely put it, corralled it all into a nice paper, which I, which I uh, enjoyed very much. Um, but I was, I had the, I don't know whether, the, is it the misfortune, the fortune of being at a DCDC DC event last week that was um, all about uh, multi-domain integration. Um, and uh, it was fascinating, really, really fascinating. I learned a huge amount, um, but I suppose it sort of made me think in relation to your applied military history, your applied history question. Um, it occurred to me that I wasn't really convinced. I wasn't sure that we understood that when we were discussing uh, MDI, we necessarily understood what was going on now, let alone what was going on, you know, I don't know, second, you know, you talked about great operate, the really fascinating operations in Normandy and other, you know, other campaigns. So, and I just, it, it, and it's not, I'm not trying asking the questions to try and trip you up. I just, you know, how do you, I mean, I could see that we needed some history in the MDI stuff. Um, but it was also even more important to have a sense as to what was going on right now. And I wasn't quite sure that, you know, uh, there was a lot of people in uniform talking to each other. But, you know, civilians like me outside of the institution, um, I was trying to say, but you've left out this. And what about that? And and so I, I, well, I'm not sure, actually, it, whether military history is the thing that you need, as opposed to just history. And and there was an earlier question, an earlier question in there from uh, one of your one of the other guys on the fight club. Who said, "Well, can units understand military history without a military historian?" I just my own as an academic. Please, of course you can. You know, you don't don't, don't require don't don't listen, don't need any of us academics to to do to do reading for you. You know, it's, you know, get stuck into books. But anyway, enough of me, Gareth. Uh, over to you. Sorry. Yeah, I I perhaps express myself poorly when when saying yes, they did need. Yeah, of course, you can get some books, and there's some great books out there. I I, I think I was saying sort of choose wisely, but when it comes to analysing. You don't necessarily need the academic or the historian there to guide to hold your hand doing the analysis, but you might need them to to put the study help you put the study together. Um, sure. To answer your question is I haven't got a clue, Matt, um, because <clears throat> what are multi-domain operations? Well, are they not just operations? Um, because <laughs> was Normandy not a multi-domain operation? Um, was Granby a multi-domain operation was Telic okay maybe less on the the, the 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 maritime although it had an involvement because are those not domains now I can't remember are those domains or are they components um and and throw in cyber so so I don't know the answer to your question I do fully accept your your line about historian and and versus military historian I've I, I've sort of used the term military because it's a military audience that we we've, we've sure. got here and and therefore uh, perhaps that's a, a better term. I don't know. Perhaps it seduces soldiers um, better than history. Um, it worked on me. I gave up history at the age of, of 14. I found it boring. Um, <clears throat> but we didn't look at military history. We were looking at history. So that's perhaps how I use the term military. But yeah, military history, history of war, uh, war, war studies, history of warfare. I, 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 I don't know the difference. Um, I know somebody tried to explain it to me the other day. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I think that's, that's that's vaguely reassuring. I've just got to say that, Gareth, because I'm not sure I knew the answer to my question, so <laughs> which is why I asked it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I wonder whether, well, I mean, I, oh, oh no, I, sorry to sort of take over again, but um, no, go ahead. Can, can I can I just um, I think Des's question there probably is getting to the... the, the, the yeah, that's what um, I was going next anyway, so but, you're but I, don't, I, don't same, leave, yeah. I don't want to leave Mike Peters' point out, and I want to come back to Mike Peters' point, if I may, afterwards, because I think it is a, another part of an answer that I didn't fully give earlier. But I think Des's question might go some way... An answer to Des's question, which I'm not necessarily going to give, might go some way to answering uh, Matthew's question. So I think you're on, Des. All right, there's technical problems at my end, trying to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got two computer screens up, so I'm absolutely completely confuddled. Um, 
Yeah, so basically my question is, is the, the best way of fusing military history and wargaming? Uh, and and I, I do both, um, but I, I'll be interested in, in, in your thoughts. Over. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, I, I don't know, um, which again is another cop-out answer. I, I, I think historical gaming has some benefit. Um, what's his name? Um, oh. Next one, Royal Irish. Um, Ivor Gardner. Ivor. I, Ivor certainly had his battalion using some um, historical base games, Normandy type 1944 action to um, train and educate his platoon commanders with the hope that they then go and educate their platoon sergeants and, 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 platoon, and, and section commanders. Um, <clears throat> I think that worked quite well for them but I think Ivor was able to, to, to crack the whip and point them in the right direction. I'm not an expert enough on historical war games, um, especially the, the sort of tabletop turn-based ones. I don't know enough about them. You and I've talked in passing, but I think, I think where the war game has utility is by playing out what you think you've learned from the military history. Now, I don't know which is chicken and which is egg or which is horse, which is cart. Uh, which leads, which follows, and 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 you might end up with a, um, a, a a seemingly virtuous circle, which isn't virtuous in the slightest. But I think that's perhaps what you do. You, you try some, you, you analyze some history, think it means this, and then you try it in a war game, which is not the same as a simulation because a simulation is running lots and lots of times. But I I think it's somewhere in that area, and I, I'm not sure the army has worked it out. If it has, I apologise to the bit of the army that has worked it out. I just clearly haven't listened to them, but. Um, do you have a you you do you have a view on that? Sorry, the. Uh, I mean, heck, I mean, again, I'm not trying to turn all these questions back on the askers. I just wonder whether you, you think about these things, Des. You you, and I wonder whether you had a, a view. No, it, it just seems to me that in this uh, day and age where we are cutting training events, um, which you know the fir the first thing you do is you cut batters to save yeah. money is is actually the um and the, and the conceptual is probably the more important you know if you're going to look at the moral and conceptual and physical yeah. bit actually if you get the conceptual bit right then actually studying military history and judicious war gaming is probably your high payoff training event uh that, that actually buys out some of the challenges yeah. you have otherwise uh and, and that's the end of my um message over yeah i i don't think i disagree um i i think that as i showed that lwc slide i think they they absolutely have are two parts and if you're not doing the bit on the right hand side if you're not using training as an engine for war or whatever we're, we're saying now you you absolutely have to up your game on the the um the left and, and center side uh, Jared, gonna, I think, I, sorry, yeah Go ahead. Do you want to close out with the final comment? Yeah. We take Mike, Mike Peters on um, because I think Mike's made a, a vital okay. point. Okay. This will be the I last question. Uh, right yeah, I know there's on. a lot of good ones out there. Uh, Mike Peters, go ahead. Can you unmute? Hey there, mate. Mike? Maybe he's disappeared. Yeah, so you can read it, do you? Okay, well, I, I'll make the point. Um, we were talking about getting junior NCOs involved uh, and senior NCOs and warrant officers. Um, some battlefield studies are across the rank structure uh, and that is uh, the opportunity, whether it's done by the unit or by the facilitator who might be a historian uh, to get um, junior NCOs, senior NCOs, warrant officers more involved and get them into it. So yes, um, it, it is absolutely possible and some units are very good at it. Uh, but I've also been on officer only battlefield studies, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Gareth, uh, thank you so much. And, and to our audience, has been you had such a really big and great audience here engaging with some big names in there. So thank you for attending. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Ed, who, you know, in the last question on you know, the, the use of uh, man war gaming to understand history, I mean, he's been helping educate me on the side here with some of the games that he's learned from. Uh, 
some of that complemented his understanding or uh, reading of history. So Ed, uh, you might want to answer that question too, and then uh, transition to close us out. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just say um, there's an example of how it could be used in the in the chats. Um, that was my first attempt at putting together a biological study uh, with Dr. Uh, Klaus from, from Sandhurst and we did use a war game, although it wasn't necessarily the most accurate, but it was useful to, to bound the reading and, and the problem statements. Uh, yeah. Okay, Gareth, uh, my turn to say next slide, please. And again. Okay, thanks. So um, just a reminder, this is part of our 2021 webinar series where we are asking members of Fight Club to sponsor a webinar. Um, so this is the first one. Um, we have a speaker identified for the 1st of April, but all the other slots are open. So please do reach out to someone to speak. Or if you have the SME uh, knowledge, as Gareth has demonstrated, um, volunteer yourself. And we will provide you all the best practice to put this together. So the burden will very much be shared. Next slide, please. Okay, our uh, website is now uh, live after many weeks of uh, titivating in the background. Um, that's the address URL at the top. This will become um, the hosting platform for a lot of the content which was previously on Slack. Slack is groaning with the amount of messages and we can't afford to pay for the premier edition. Uh, yeah, Arnel's just put it in the chat. Um, so in future, please head there. Um, you can also sign up for a newsletter uh, feed. Um, uh, and that is going to be where you can get access to stuff. Next slide, please. Uh, so something you will see coming up over the weekend, uh, Operation Crimson Dawn, um, using one of our premier games, Combat Mission Shock Force 2, uh, a head-to-head -head engagement. Uh, you'll be seeing a after-action report that will go up on the website. Uh, and just as a quick taster, here is a Twitter thread roll up going into the chat there. Next slide, please. So another game we're using is uh, Flashpoint Campaigns, which is more of your traditional hex encounter, uh, top down, slightly higher tactical than combat mission, um, but therefore allows you to fight sort of battle group level uh, operations. Uh, so Operation Waning Sound is the campaign of learning uh, three uh, missions with the UK Battle Group using Fight Tonight, uh, All Bats and Tech. Uh, we've got 50 licenses, although we've given away a couple. Uh, and just as a quick taster, uh, here is one of our fighters, uh, AAR, again, a Twitter roll up, just going into the chat there. Next slide, please. That's mission one, the delay mission. Um, so you can see it is based on um, sort of military logic, it isn't just a, a sort of fun game for fun's sake. Um, this was a way we would advertise it on Twitter to try and get some more conversation for the military community. Um, so if you do uh, sign up and learn how to play flashback campaigns, you too can participate in this and see how you do against those um, ruthless Denovians on the left. Next slide, please. And Operation Thunderclap 2 leads directly on from Thunderclap 1. The Thunderclap series uses both combat mission uh, for the lower tactical and flashpoint campaigns for higher tactical. Um, we're running a second bound for 8th to 11th of March. If you want to be a part, you need to be a member of Fight Club. You need to be UK um, government accredited. Um, that's because it's operating a higher classification. And you do need to have familiarity with at least one of these two games. So you either need to do the Uprising Moon campaign of learning for combat mission, or you need to do the Waning Sun campaign of learning for flashpoint campaigns. Next slide, please. And just uh, agree today, we're going to get some licenses for virtual uh, battle space four, which is the uh, latest release from Bohemian Interactive Simulations. Um, Defense Virtual Simulation currently uses VBS3. So this is a step change above and graphically uh, awesome, but also in terms of what you can do functionality in, in the software. Again, if you uh, want to be involved in that, then Gregor Deeming is the man to contact internally through Slack. Next slide, please. 
And lastly, for those who aren't already members of Fight Club, and if you've liked what you've you, uh, witnessed and um, heard me speak about tonight, then please do uh, join the fight, uh, head to our Twitter, uh, or just access uh, this link that I'm putting into the chat there. Uh, fill in an MS form and one of us will 